camera is on. Uh, wonderful. Uh, thanks, everyone. Uh, I'm sorry it took me um, a little longer than I expected to find the right room. Um, but here I am. I'm glad uh, everybody's here, uh, considering that the Oscars uh, begin in about an hour. <laughs> so, okay, let's start. Um, so this is an, an outline of the webinar. Uh, so first I will give you a bit of a, an overview of uh, who I am and uh, what I do and uh, why um, I'm doing this kind of uh, research and uh, pedagogical orientation. So I will share my motivations to learn more about the topic. I will discuss what I learned about academic writing and plagiarism from non-Western perspectives. And I will present some ideas on how uh, culture, cultural differences and similarities could be unpacked in the advanced uh, EAP classroom. I will share uh, what I've learned and uh, what I'm doing with uh, this focus on identity and imagination in my ESL classes. And uh, I will invite you to discuss the ideas introduced in the presentation and uh, collaborate by adding your thoughts. And uh, we can certainly continue this conversation uh, via email uh, later on. So first of all, um, I will tell you about myself. So I am an experienced language instructor. I've taught ESL or EFL in Spanish, uh, mostly uh, in North America and South America. I am an emerging scholar with an interest on language and social identities, multiliteracies, and language teacher education. I'm also a husband and father of two children. So you can see the picture on the top. Uh, that's my family. Uh, that was on family day weekend. Uh, we went to the aquarium. And so that's uh, Diana, Sophie, Joshua, and Marine Ray. She's not part of my family, that last one. Um, um, I'm also passionate about photography and uh, the pictures that you see uh, in the presentation are my own photographs. And I included that one about um, the train tracks uh, that show that uh, long uh, way to go because by no means what I'm sharing today is uh, or represents in any way the end of this journey. <laughs> I am um, figuring things out along the way. So that's why I invite everyone to share their ideas. <laughs> Thank you for the comment, Jen. She says that the train analogy is so Canadian. OK, so um, I am currently teaching language and identity at Ryerson University. Um, which uh, really links into my uh, doctoral research, which was on um, how uh, future language teachers develop their professional teacher identities uh, in um, FSL, English as a second language or as a foreign language in three different contexts, um, Canada, uh, Chile, and Colombia. And the other class that I'm teaching right now is an advanced English uh, for academic purposes, uh, reading and writing at Sheridan. So uh, there it is, uh, Marine Ray again. <laughs> so I brought this picture up because uh, when I was thinking about plagiarism, um, I looked at the definition and uh, I was thinking about how much I knew uh, with regard to uh, this situation and also uh, what my approach has been um, as a teacher. And uh, I found it to be really restrictive, like that definition that uh, it's pretty much taking somebody else's idea and passing them as if they were our own ideas, which uh, is the equivalent of stealing. Uh, and also, uh, when I was looking at the marine race at the aquarium, I was I wanted to learn more about these creatures, so I looked them up, and um, all I could find in the Oxford English Dictionary was a definition for the stingray. But uh, do all marine rays sting? Not really. But don't quote me on that because I am not marine biologist. <laughs> so uh, let's begin our first discussion. And uh, these are pretty much the questions that I was asking in the introduction um, for this uh, webinar. So 
Is it a recurrent issue that you find when teaching um, academic writing? Have you noticed your students uh, repeating their mistakes after you spent hours giving them feedback on the first uh, draft of an essay? And uh, what do you think might be some of the reasons or motivations uh, to plagiarize? So I'm looking forward to your comments um, and you can uh, type them on the chat box. <laughs> a recurrent issue, says Jen Arton. Um, absolutely, but their Google skills are excellent. Uh, Roberto Chavarria uh, says, uh, laughing out loud, ha, ha, ha. <laughs> so yes. Um, any other comments, any uh, personal experiences that you would want to share? Okay, so Yvonne Marshall says, it has not been an issue for me, but I know that it is because I was asked how I would address recently uh, in a job interview. Uh, Meher Sheikh says, uh, yes, and Freshte Fresh Mohtari says, they're not interested in the topic, so they do not have ideas. And Anna Bartosik says, my experiences are the same as yours, Marlon. Okay, I plagiarized, I plagiarized to get an easy pass. It's definitely a recurring issue. They often don't understand what they're reading. And we see that uh, it is definitely a recurrent issue. And we can see that uh, from your comments that um, it might be lack of uh, self-confidence or it might be that they want to get an easy pass. Um, it might be uh, that um, they don't quite understand what is implied by um, actually uh, presenting um, or doing their own work based on uh, learning about other people's ideas, right? Okay, so uh, frustration. They get frustrated not being able to get a good mark. So yes, it is definitely, uh, a challenging um, issue to tackle, uh, maybe not understanding what plagiarism is. Okay, so Barbara has a very interesting comment that I'm going to read. One student plagiarized from the Quran because he wanted perfection, but it was an often quoted passage, so I recognized it. All right, so there we have it. Uh, some very, um, interesting ideas that I guess are not new to any of us who have had uh, this experience in class. Um, so let's move on into the following slides and I'm going to share uh, my case and my situation and how I felt about it. So just as it happens with marine race, there are many more factors we must consider when understanding what plagiarism is and what causes it. So I will move on with my case, uh, what I observed and what motivates my own reflection. So I was teaching a content-based uh, English for academic purposes course to a predominantly Chinese student population, and they had to write two in-class essays. So uh, I noticed the same recurrent mistakes I spent um, hours uh, like giving my students feedback and then they were still doing the same stuff uh, in the in the final version of the essay or in their second essay. A notable example of this was an abundant presence of uh, fragments taken from other texts without doing a proper um, APA style in-text citation or reference. So yes, different writing conventions. That's a very good point that um, Hangzhou uh, Rebecca uh, is uh, also sharing. So this was driving me nuts because I was uh, spending lots of hours marking two uh, poorly written essays. Uh, so one of the changes that we've uh, done recently in that class is that we're doing only one essay but they do a rough draft and then they have to take up the feedback and resubmit. But um, 
I'll share what I did before uh, we took this measure. So um, I contacted this um, colleague of mine. Uh, she's also an OEC graduate, uh, Dr. Yamin Khan. Uh, she's at the School of English and Education at Guangdong University of Foreign Studies. So I said, hi, Yamin. Uh, how are you? This is happening to me. Uh, I have, uh, I'm dealing with a lot of plagiarism among my Chinese students. And I want to know if you have any suggestions or um, any advice uh, in general of like to help me understand why they're doing this. So she made a list of uh, five different uh, reasons and uh, she consulted this with her students. This is what she said. After I got your questions, I asked, your question, I asked a number of students and my colleagues so I can give you a more comprehensive view of this issue. My students believed that it, it is because of the following reasons. So number one, their previous writing experiences are partially based on copying others' writing encouraged by their teachers. Um, in their elementary and junior schools, their teachers told them to copy good sentences and memorize them and then try to use the sentences in their own writing without any reference to the source. I was also taught so. This history makes most Chinese students believe that copying is also part of writing. So then number five in her list was paraphrase. They know they should paraphrase, but they do not know to what extent it is paraphrasing. I don't mean to question your teaching, but I think students did not take it seriously. They may learn the skills from your teaching without enough awareness. They may not realize that if they do not use this skill effectively, they can lose their certificate or degree. And last, she says, my students want me to tell you that most Chinese students, including them, do not plagiarize because they know it is a serious issue. I teach them academic writing. Usually students who uh, plagiarize are not good students in China, their words. So you may need to be stricter and more patient to them. So, hmm. How can you be more strict and more patient? Um, that was a, a good question to ask, right? Being stricter and more patient. So um, let's share some of those thoughts. So this is uh, our discussion number two. So we have uh, these three excerpts uh, from my conversation with Yamin Kian. Uh, about plagiarism. Uh, she says this history makes most Chinese students believe that copying is also part of writing and uh, they may learn the skills from your teaching without enough awareness and again so you may be stricter and more patient to them. So how can you uh, reconcile that? What could you do in your own teaching situation to consider uh, Yamin's um, advice? Any thoughts? The history of this might be new to some of us and uh, the consequences of plagiarizing, yes, that's something I think that we most often do, right? Um, teaching different ways of saying the same thing, so I guess maybe um, uh, paraphrasing, right? Uh, like working on further developing our students' uh, skills to paraphrase uh, is what we most often do. Okay, and then uh, discussing cultural differences, uh, rewriting, yes, explaining them, uh, the task clearly and our expectations uh, before they do the assignment. Okay, so good. So Aaron is saying, agree, I agree with Constance. Give the assignment back and don't accept the assignment until the issue is fixed. So that is be strict, but also patient. That's a very good point. So yes, paraphrase is better, says Patricia. <laughs> and then we have a comment about Trump. <laughs> Trump writes her scripts. Uh, OK. Okay, providing examples of plagiarism is also a very good idea, I think. Uh, teaching students how to connect ideas and uh, write a proper synthesis. So Patricia Armstrong Caldera is saying, I was taught to take down my teacher's notes so I understand. 
Okay, uh, explaining expectations. All right, all of these are very good ideas. Uh, thanks for sharing. Uh, using Lego might also be a very good option. Thanks, Rebecca. Okay, and then there is an article uh, by Chris uh, Spence, so we might check that out later. Wonderful. Okay, so I'm going to move on to share uh, what I've been doing in my classes. So, first of all, I did a fair amount of reading um, on uh, this issue and what research says about it. Uh, and I'm going to share just a, a few bits of uh, what I found. Uh, but my approach has been highly influenced by Penny Cook's view. So uh, Alistair Penny Cook says that avoiding plagiarism needs to be seen not as some academic convention students need to master, but rather as a complex constellation of issues to do with concepts of the author and textual ownership, uh, questions of language learning and saying things in one's words, uh, cultural and educational orientations toward text and memorization, and therefore questions of language and identity. And that really resonated with me because I do identity research. Um, okay, so Patricia Armstrong has a question and that question is, how are you going to be strict with them? So let's keep that in mind as we move on. And um, here I'm gonna share more uh, of uh, what research says. So Gu and Brooks did a very interesting study. Uh, they had 10, 10 Chinese students and they looked at the writing experiences and perceptions of plagiarism of these students during their year of um, study in a UK university. And they say that an important aspect of international students' intercultural experiences is their endeavor to adapt to and grow through the host culture and educational conventions. Their perceptions of plagiarism amongst many other culturally embedded values and beliefs challenged by the new context may also change as they're trying to survive and succeed in their studies, thus pointing to the dynamic nature of plagiarism. So the understanding of plagiarism might change over time. And uh, some of the things that uh, Gwen Brooks uh, point out in their um, study is that for some students initially, it was much more like, um, you know, when you give an essay assignment, uh, you often have a bunch of students that come to you and ask, so how many references do we have to include here? So what they noticed is that this idea of the references seemed to be like, just part of the mechanics of writing the essay to some of the participants, because the important thing was the creative process, like writing the thing, like I will just add those references at the end. But what these students started developing was this idea that uh, the essay and the topic they were writing about all this knowledge is constructed on prior knowledge and that they have to read other people's work and build on that in order to provide um, an informed view of the topic that they're discussing. So on that note, uh, this is discussion number three. And I see that the conversation is very active in the chat room. So uh, the questions are, what do you think about these research findings? And uh, consider possible ways in which you can implement what these researchers suggest in your own classrooms. So we have um, role playing as one suggestion. So discussing the impact of having someone else putting their name on your ori original work. So that is a very interesting idea. Um, and, and I guess that reinforces that idea that uh, in the end, if you don't properly acknowledge your sources, then you're stealing somebody else's idea, right? 
But um, so what else can you do in your own teaching situations? Okay, so yes, uh, that point uh, by Juliana about um, using technology to avoid plagiarism. Um, so that is a very important point because these days uh, in, in most uh, institutions we have access to, uh, at least in colleges and universities, we have turn it in, right? So we can use that tool and we can activate uh, the little uh, box to uh, have students see uh, like the percentage uh, the percentage to which uh, their uh, work resembles uh, somebody else's work, right? And it gives you like, um, I was just checking uh, this morning some of my students' essays and one of them said like 60% uh, <laughs> similar to other people's work. So that is when you see uh, things are a bit problematic, right? So uh, sufficient examples on paraphrasing So Roberto says, uh, sitting with students who have issues with plagiarism and have them see me writing, they can see the the way I develop the idea. Okay, that that's a, using Google. You know, before Turnitin, I used to tell my students, uh, if you could find that piece on Google, guess what? I can find it too, right? Okay, so Barbara says trying to survive often can mean a temptation to overborrow because they're young and adapting to so much at once. So that is a very good point, right? Um, one of the things that uh, Gwen Brooks uh, found out in their study was that actually uh, to some of these students um, copying like directly, was part of the writing process. They were just learning uh, the vocabulary and how to do a proper paraphrase. Remember it when we talk about paraphrasing, we say change the words and change the structure. So it is not like a lineal process. Uh, it's uh, it's much more of a, of a longer process. And what uh, Penny Cook says is that um, it has to do with the de with the development of, of an identity, right? Like changing the way I am and I understand plagiarism. Okay, so what is a good percentage, says Bobby. That's a good point. I guess we always have to, uh, like, turn it in, we'll just point these things out. But sometimes, and what I've seen in, in, in some of my students' essays is that sometimes they, uh, because it's the rough draft, they're adding stuff at the end and they're saying, I took these fragments just to um, actually build uh, the body of my essay and they just put that in the end. So I guess... Turnitin is a great tool, but uh, we are the ones that are marking these essays, right? Okay, so let's move on. And this is my approach. So um, as I said before, I do identity research. Um, and uh, this is what I've been trying to do uh, in my classes. So I am helping my English language learners develop their academic English language user or writer identities. And how am I doing that? I'm helping them develop their uh, cognitive and academic language proficiency. Uh, I'm also helping them develop uh, their intercultural communicative awareness. And I am empowering them through criticality. So um, I'm going to give you some examples of how I approach this, but before that, I'm going to briefly introduce the main um, conceptual lenses that are informing this approach. I'm getting there, Karen. <laughs> I will begin with identity, right? And then I will move on into what CALP is, okay? 
All right, so um, identity. What is identity? I'm looking at identity uh, from uh, Bonnie Norton's uh, definition, which is how a person understands his or her relationship to the world, how that relationship is structured across time and space, and how the person understands possibilities for the future. So I, I always tell my students that identity is who I was that brought me to where I am now, right? Who I am now and who I want to be in the future because that imaginary part of who I want to be in the future is what helps me uh, uh, in all of the decision-making process in the present. Okay, Elaine, uh, it is a concept uh, that uh, has been uh, developed by many uh, scholars. So uh, identity uh, in this view is um, seen from a post-structural lens and identity is seen as uh, varied and changing and often in conflict. Like it is negotiated in different spaces. So what Pennycook argues is that the process of becoming better um, writers uh, of academic English has to do with the process of developing that academic English writer identity. And that's what I'm trying to do in my classes. So let's move on to uh, that notion. And this comes from Jim Cummins's work, uh, which is uh, the Bix and Culp. So, uh, some of the earliest uh, work by Dr. Jim Cummins uh, was done uh, here in Toronto, and he was looking at um, students that were uh, relatively recent immigrants and uh, why they had been referred to uh, psychological assessment and why uh, they were uh, considered like to have some sort of uh, impediment or some uh, learning difficulties. So what he noticed is that even though these students uh, were um, highly proficient in English and they sounded like a native speaker of English, uh, they lacked uh, the cognitive academic language proficiency that they needed to succeed in school. So um, he made that distinction and he used uh, this metaphor of an iceberg. So what you see at the top is the Bix, and that is the basic interpersonal communication skills. Uh, and that is uh, students can communicate quite effectively in English and they may sound like uh, native speakers of English, but then they might not have what it needs to uh, function properly in an academic context because it's quite challenging because you're um, using fewer nonverbal cues uh, and the language is more abstract, all that. Okay, so let's move on into concept number three. So um, we're all familiar with the communicative competence uh, notion, right? And uh, Michael Byram um, adds to this communicative competence the need for this intercultural competence. So uh, this builds on that idea that um, we made we, we need to see um, our students L1 as a resource. It's not uh, an impediment or and it's not interfering. Uh, with uh, the learning of the L2, but what we uh, think about uh, bilingual or plurilingual people is that they're not the sum of two monolinguals uh, or several monolinguals, right? What they have is that they have a larger repertoire of words and structures and they use it. And sometimes that can get mixed up and that's okay. Uh, so this intercultural competence has a lot to do with also being uh, more willing to learn about new things and new ways of seeing things, new ways of doing things like writing, for example. Um, so that is also uh, key. 
to help students see that uh, in English we do things differently. And I always tell them uh, that English is very uh, demanding on the writer's side, right? Because you have to take the reader by the hand and tell the reader we're doing this and this is, this is my thesis statement and that's what I'm going to explain. And you have to do that, but you do it indirectly. So it's a bit of a challenge, right? Okay. So let's move on into the last concept. Uh, this comes from the work of Jim Cummins as well. So um, he has this nested pedagogical orientations and he says that they, these three orientations should be part of learning. So the first one in the um, inner concentric circle is the transmission oriented and is much more of the like teacher centered approach. Uh, students listen. Um, the outer circle is the social constructivist, and this is what um, I was taught to do uh, when I was doing my teacher preparation program, uh, that uh, classes should be much more student-centered, and students uh, and teachers co-construct knowledge together, right? But he says that there should also be another very important component, and that is a critical component uh, I'm sorry, uh, I see that there's no sound. Okay, good. All right, so he says that the transformative component should look at um, issues of power, relations of power in different contexts, uh, look at things from, from a critical point of view. So, uh, he says that uh, this should all be part of the learning process. Okay, so I'm gonna share uh, some of the activities that I'm doing in my classes to help uh, my students. Uh, so many of the ideas that you uh, have shared uh, here resonate with this. How do we develop our um, English language learners cognitive and academic language proficiency? And I think that um, ESL teachers in general are very talented and do wonderful things to help students this way. So uh, for instance, we help them with their academic writing. We teach them how to do a proper paraphrase, paragraph writing, essay writing, grammar. Then we teach them about APA style, how to do a proper uh, in-text citation, reference list, all that. Uh, the examples that you said, um, I've, I've I even brought some a couple of examples in which somebody has plagiarized my work in a published book. Um, so very interesting for sure. Uh, also, um, in helping students um, develop um, proper academic research skills, um, I have brought uh, librarians uh, so that. They teach us all the tricks on how to do um, a proper uh, search in databases. And then this is something else um, I've been doing, and this is to help my students um, learn about uh, that intercultural communicative competence. So this comes from uh, my experience at Ryerson University. So the class that I teach is called Language and Identity. So um, we have a lesson on this theory of linguistic relativity, which is based on something that is called the Sapir-Whorf hypothesis. So what they say, Sapir and Whorf, is that the languages that we speak uh, are, uh, they influence the way we perceive the world and they influence uh, the way we act. So this was a chapter of the book that uh, my colleagues were not very happy about teaching. Uh, they didn't like it much, but they thought it was too difficult. And I was precisely thinking the opposite. I, I thought it's so cool. We need to do this and that. So I brought um, a reading by Lara Boroditsky. Uh, a very simple reading. And uh, she does uh, these, she provides these examples. Uh, and one of them is how um, 
the Taori people in um, Australia, uh, they speak Cook Taori, and this is a language that um, does not rely as much on prepositions as we do to locate things. Uh, they use cardinal points, so they have to say, for example, the glass is north, but the actual north is not with regard to me, right? Uh, so they really need to know where they are. So that's one of the things that I had my students do. Uh, we did this reading uh, that provides different examples of how the languages we speak uh, have an impact on the way we perceive the world. And uh, teaching at Ryerson, you know that uh, in Toronto, uh, the lake is south, right? Then um, I had my students um, stand up, close their eyes, and I said, with your eyes closed, point north. And that's what they did. So um, then, th that, then I said, open your eyes and look around. Leave your hands where they are. <laughs> Pointing to the ceiling, yes. <laughs> uh, and it made it very evident that in the languages that we had in this very diverse class, we had Russian, we had Arabic, we had uh, French, uh, we had Spanish. Uh, maybe one or two people knew where North was, and it was because in Toronto, uh, and being that close to the lake uh, at Ryerson, you know, the lake is south, right? Another thing that we did is that I gave them these pictures and, and I had them, um, like some of this work they did in groups. So I gave them pictures of um, these um, babies and like their um, development um, sequence. And I said, okay, organize them from one to eight. And uh, most often I got this kind of, um, organization from left to right. In a few classes, I got it the opposite way. Picture one was uh, um, the furthest on the right. And then um, from then on up to eight, the furthest left. And this Boroditsky says has to do with the way we write. If we write from, um, left to right, then uh, we perceive that time moves on from left to right. If we write Hebrew, we might think otherwise. Another thing that we did was uh, plurilingual family trees. And they did these beautiful trees. I gave them just the silhouette and I said, okay, so um, can you please include all of the uh, words that you have for family? Uh, members in the different languages that you speak and then we had a conversation like each group was reporting back and we would make connections to the reading and then they said okay um maybe the word uncle okay tell me what you have for uncle in those different languages and then they would be like oh chinese oh my god uh we have like four words because we have to be very careful like because you don't want to sound disrespectful it depends on like if the uncle is on your mother's side or on your father's side. So this was to make them um, realize that um, there are different ways of communicating things and that um, this is connected to the languages that we speak and our cultural backgrounds. Okay, so the lesson wrap up for this, uh, and that's going to happen in two weeks at Ryerson. Um, I convinced our coordinator that we needed to buy the movie Arrival because that movie is based on the Sapir Whorf hypothesis and we're gonna see how that goes. But looking at uh, this chapter from that point of view really helped them, uh, help my students realize that um, there is a wealth of resources that they have available in different languages and that there's no right or wrong it's just diversity, and that's wonderful. Okay, so the other thing that I'm doing is I um, encourage my students to be critical 
and we did this reading um, by Paul Verhag about neoliberalism and this was just a newspaper article and I had um, students look at these questions and consider them so who is it that is writing what credentials does this author have what biases do you think this person might have uh, is it factual or is it based on personal opinion can you tell if it's fact or opinion uh, is the argument convincing uh, has the author done empirical research um, is he or she presenting the results of uh, their own empirical research are, are there any stats to support that quotations uh, is it convincing is it effective uh, like to support detail and I had students do posters uh, in groups and you see in this one this the topic is right in the middle uh, and then they say okay Plover Hag who's this guy oh he's a professor of clinical psychology so they looked him up uh, to see if uh, how credible was this person right uh, then uh, they looked at uh, how well supported were his arguments if there was an empirical empirical research backing that up um, if it was based on opinion or what so this is another poster this one is much more focused on the actual content um, of the um, article so what you see is that they're doing their best to uh, like not take everything that they read at face value and exploring things much more uh, and also uh, developing that's a good point Cynthia we're getting there I don't know I'm I'm working on this I'm sharing my ideas with you and we'll see I guess uh, we can keep in touch that's a good excuse to keep in touch and see if this is actually working uh, and this is the way I focused on identity so as, again as I said I, I am an identity researcher so uh, we've been doing autobiographical narratives uh, so we have in my thesis I did multimodal identity texts uh, they were done on voice thread and uh, they were wonderful and we do this at, at Ryerson uh, but at Sheridan I had I haven't had the same flexibility just because uh, the other course is on identity right the one I teach at Ryerson whereas at Sheridan I'm teaching um, within the pacing that I have and I'm trying to infuse uh, identity issues in class and see how students respond so one of the things that we did was uh, they had to record a narrative so I had students do this narrative about uh, their own journeys uh, and they shared um, their student their, their experiences as students uh, anything they wanted to share okay thanks Bobby and um, the the other thing that I've done is identity portraits so I give them a silhouette this blank silhouette markers and crayons and I tell them use anything that you want to uh, tell me about you tell me about what you like your interests um, use words use drawings use colors and look at these beauties wait this is the reflection of um, before we look at the beauties this is the reflection of one of the students uh, who did an identity text so he said it allows me to reflect on who I am and who I want to be in order to complete the project um, I have to not only think about past and present but also my future asking stories when I was a child reminds me of some valuable memories when I was thinking my, about my future I knew what job I want to get based on my interest and major in the university therefore every word and image illustrates a real light the reason why I used many images in my identity text is that um, images is are the most visual way to show readers information and they're easier than recording my voice okay so that is one student's reflection we do a behind the scenes uh, 
on the uh, identity text. So the identity text that this student did was um, an autobiography done uh, multimodally using uh, VoiceThread. So he shared who he is, uh, who he wants to be, his dreams, his passions, his interests. And these are the identity portraits that students have been doing in class. So you see at uh, Sheridan, I have um, people that are a lot into visual arts and they've done this amazing um, work and you see they share some stuff that you don't learn in the traditional essay. So this student on the, who did the portrait on the left says, this is a safety helmet. This, this means I like playing uh, roller skating. Uh, this is a pillow, uh, my favorite thing is um, sleeping, I can sleep for 20 hours. This student uh, who did the identity portrait on the right, she wants to do visual arts. So photography, drawing, all that is very big on her. And then one of the things that I've noticed is that if students have been here for a very short period of time, like since September, you see a lot more of that Chinese identity. Like you can see on uh, the portrait that is on the left. But the more time they spend in Canada, you begin to see this and you see the portrait on the left. Uh, you see that dual identity. So there's the red side. And this student says in China, I had more negative uh, induced uh, emotions. I was mad. I was rude. In Canada, I have more positive emotions. I am calm. I am optimistic. So you see there's change. And that is that identity that is changing. That I think what I'm trying to argue here is that there's that possibility of... Um, developing that English user, English academic, English writer identity. And it should be part of this identitary journey that students are going through. Okay, and you can see one more example here on the right. You see plurilingualism, right? Cantonese, English. There's also um, Mandarin. Uh, so definitely lots of interesting things to talk about students did this and then they shared in their groups and they were asking each other questions it was a very um lovely discussion so those are my ideas i don't know uh yet to which extent they will improve um like dealing with plagiarism but uh, I wanted to share that with you. And now, since we have about five minutes, I'd like to hear from you or see if you have any questions. Thank you very much. OK. So developing uh, identity confidence, uh, which will eventually lead to more independent writing. Yes, I guess that's what I'm trying to do. Uh, Marlon, uh, Jen yes. wanted to know if there would be material if you had any resource material available regarding plagiarism. Okay, um, you know, what I can do is I can uh, maybe uh, create a folder uh, at, with, the, with some resources, like some um, articles. Uh, Penny Cook is one of the uh, big names that um, has looked at plagiarism in the past uh, decade. And Barb wanted to know if Link lacks, um, if you can use Link and CALP. Yes, uh, absolutely. I guess uh, Link has uh, these um, these um, factors that make it challenging, like the uh, con continuous intake and all that, uh, but. There's definitely room uh, for uh, teaching uh, um, cognitive and academic language uh, skills to, to uh, link learners, for sure. So I, I, I truly invite everybody to uh, share their ideas and uh, send me an email anytime. 
uh, so that we can continue this conversation. As I said before, uh, I'm sharing my ideas with you. I, I mean, if you are here on a Sunday night before the Oscars, you're wonderful educators and you're truly interested in this. So I feel very thankful to all of you. Well, thank you, Dr. Valencia, on behalf of TESOL Ontario and the webinar team for their great presentation. Thank you, Bobby, for all of your wonderful help. Okay. And I'd like to remind everyone, don't forget the survey. Please fill it out and return it so we can continue to make these the best ever. And if you should have, you should have your PD certificates within a week, please make sure you sign up for the next webinar on March 21st. Literacy Assessment Results, Understanding the L Factor, and March 25th, Teaching Intercultural Awareness and Communication. Thank you all for attending, and enjoy the Oscars. Thanks. Good night, everyone. You can log out on the top right. <laughs>